Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Praise God. Hey, we're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. I believe that God has a message for you and I. So if you would, just honor the Lord by standing to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together and invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and Lord, what a joy and an honor it is when we get to come into your house and experience your presence, sing your praises, God, and Lord, we want to go deeper and further with you. God, I pray that as we open up your word, Holy Spirit, that you open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. And God, I I just pray that uh, you would give us the wisdom and the direction, the vision, the understanding that we need, God. Lord, be our guide, be our teacher, be our healer, our encourager, and our equipper. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you speak to each and every one. Words that I didn't even speak, Lord, that you come and you minister to the hearts, God. Give grace to the hearer tonight, Lord, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for that. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters, and we love them. We don't think of ourselves as any better than anyone, but as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Get your Bible out. Tonight, we're talking about love God and love people. This is part number four, and anybody get blessed by this series so far? I mean, it's just been phenomenal. I don't know about you, but for, for me personally, I have gotten so much out of this series, and I was just amazed at what Pastor Luke and Pastor Paul brought uh, the past three weeks. It's just been great. Real quick to review, because I, I believe that it's worth saying again. I believe it's worth reviewing what we've already talked about, because it's so rich, and there's no way that you can take this down and gulp this down. You've got to take it slow. It's like a, it's like a nice cheesecake. You know what I'm talking about? You can't just gulp that thing down. If you do, you're going to get a sour stomach. You know, you got to take a little bite. You know, you get a little bit of the cheesecake, a little bit of the graham cracker crust, and and you kind of smudge it around in the raspberry sauce, and you take your time with it. So tonight, we're going to review a little bit, and then we'll get into the meat of the message. How many of you are hungry now for cheesecake? Praise God. Matthew chapter 22 is where we launched out. Matthew chapter number 22, verse number 37. Matthew chapter 22. If you have your Bible, you can go there with me. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse number 37. Jesus is speaking. They've just asked him a question. They said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And now here Jesus is. He opens up his mouth and he says these words. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In other words, everything you got needs to go towards loving God. That's the greatest commandment in the law. So verse 38, Jesus says, this is the first and great commandment. In other words, if you're going to do one thing, if you're going to just obey one law, that's the law you need to go after is, is loving God with everything that you are. All of your faculties, everything that's at your disposal, use it to love God. But then verse 39 comes along and he says this, and he says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to say, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, if you were to sum up the entirety of the law and the prophets, what they were saying, it could be summed up in two things, love God and love people. And so for our lives, we think, man, that's so simplistic, that's, that's so easy, that's so simple, there's got to be more to that. Well, how many of you know the moment you start trying to love God, all of a sudden it gets very difficult? The moment you start trying to love other people, it exponentially gets more difficult. Because I think we make some, some uh, you know, we, we make room for God to be God and we say, okay, you know, I can love God and we don't see God and, and sometimes it's easy to ignore God because God's not, you know, physically there or we can't hear his voice and so sometimes we say, oh, I love God even though in our lifestyle it might be a little different. But then when it comes to people, people are in our face. People are in our space. People are in our lives, and it gets more and more difficult because you can't just ignore people. You can't just shut them out. And if you do, you'll find yourself being ignored and alienated. So Jesus comes along. He says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And we talked about to love God. To love God is to honor God, if you remember in part number one. To love God is to revere and fear God. We talked about the fear of the Lord this morning. To love God is to submit to God and to seek 
God. That's what love does. Love seeks. Love submits. Also to represent God. How about these ones? To love God is to stay in relationship with him. That because we love God, we're loyal to him. We, we won't depart from him. And also to push past discomfort. And I like how Pastor Paul talked about this kind of applies. He, he applied it more on the people side. But I believe that sometimes there's a discomfort when it comes to loving God. Sometimes we don't know if we're doing things the right way. Sometimes we don't, we don't want to look foolish. There's that discomfort of the flesh where we say, you know what, God is really pushing me. It's kind of like when we sing those songs where you have to jump, you know. Uh, sometimes people say, well, I'm not a jumper. And there have been times where I've been tired, I've been weary, I've been worn out, and, and here comes a jumping song, and, and I'm sitting there, and I'm raising my hands to the Lord, or I'm clapping, and it's almost like the Holy Spirit leans over and whispers in my ear, will you jump for me? And I said, Lord, but I don't want to jump. And he says, but don't you love me? Of course, Lord, I love you, but do I have to jump to love you? And Holy Spirit's silent. It's like, well, Lord, I'll, I'll be a fool for you. Uh, you know what? I will be a fool for Jesus, and here I am jumping up and down for the Lord, right? Why? Because I love God, and, and, and I just want to push past the flesh, push past the discomfort of what's somebody going to think about me, push past the, that insecurity that says maybe someone will think less of me. No, listen, I don't care what other people think about me. The only one who I want somebody to think something of me, his name is Jesus. So to push past discomfort. But then also we can apply this to people as well. And, and if we're going to love people, we've got to push past ourselves. We've got to push past the discomfort. We've got to push past the insecurities. See, because in the natural, we want to isolate. We want to insulate, right? We want us to be cozy, warm, and fuzzy. And, and, and we just want it all good. Everything's copacetic. And, and, and don't move anything. Don't touch anything. Don't rock the boat. And yet God's calling us out of the boat. God's calling us to walk a walk of faith. God is calling us to love people as well. And last week we heard from Pastor Luke once again, to love people is to love God. That if we really love God, we'll do what he says. And we'll go out there and love people. We'll, we'll love what God loves. Because we are the beloved of God. That God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. See, God is in love with people. And if we're in love with God, then we've got to love what God loves. Also, to love people is to follow Christ, to follow him in his sacrifice. To love God and to love people is to sacrifice. Jesus said, greater, has, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did, and now that's what you and I are to do for one another. And finally, to love people is to be sincere. In other words, you can't wear a mask. You, you can't be hypocritical in this. People are going to sniff you out like a bloodhound. And they, they know a fake. People know a hypocrite. People know when you're smiling and you're lying through your teeth. I mean, they can just sense it. They, they were telling me they love me, but I know they don't. They were telling me they, 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 they want me to come to their church, but I'm not going to that church, man. They, they're, pff, -uh, not, not the way that they are, right? Why? Because they can sniff out a fake. Actually, an interesting side thought to take a little rabbit trail for a second. Sincere. If you look up the original word, it talks about being without wax. And what they would do is they'd have these pottery vessels, and they would have these cracks in them, and they used to fill them in with wax, and then they would paint over the top of it so you didn't know that the vessel was cracked. Well, if the people were going to use those vessels for, like, hot foods or things like that, they would put that hot food in there, and how many of you know wax melts? And so they would find out that that vessel was cracked when they put the hot food in it because the wax would melt. So they would find a vessel, and they would hold it up to the light to see if it was insincere. See, you and I, when we're going to love people, we've got to hold that up to the light, and we've got to show ourselves to be without wax, to be uncracked, to be stable and sturdy in our love, and to be sincere. That was just a, a side note. That's all for free. Verse 39 of Matthew chapter 22, we're told to love our neighbor as ourselves. To love our neighbors as ourselves. Quick thought. That means if we're to love our neighbors as ourselves, how do we love ourselves? Just ask yourself that question. How do I love myself? Sometimes people say, well, I don't love myself. You know, I don't like myself. I, I, I'm ugly. I'm stupid. I'm this. I'm that, right? And we could go through the list. You ask somebody what they like about themselves. Well, they don't have anything on that list. But what they don't like about themselves or what they would change about themselves, all of a sudden you got stacks, right? All sorts of stuff. But let me ask you this. Did you wake up this morning and take a shower? Hopefully. D did you feed yourself this morning? This afternoon, before you came to church, yeah, yeah. Did you clothe yourself? 
When you go out and go shopping, do you buy stuff that you don't like or that you do like? Thank you, Pastor Eleanor. <laughs> Pastor Eleanor buys stuff that she likes. <laughs> See? So for you and I, we know how to love ourselves. We know how to take care of ourselves. If I'm hungry, feed me, right? Self, feed myself, right? Why? Because I'm hungry. Uh, I need new clothes. These ones are old. These ones are worn out. These ones are tattered. I'm going to go get myself some new clothes. So now here comes the word of God saying to love your neighbor as yourself. That means that when you see a need in someone else's life, you take the initiative and you do to them what you would have done for yourself. Plain and simple. That's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you, right? So if you see somebody with a need or if you see somebody that's out there doing their thing, you know, it's almost like being able to get outside of yourself for a second. And if you put yourself in their shoes, put yourself in their position, and you find yourself walking up to that position, what would you want someone to do to you? You see that, you grab the initiative, and then you do it for them. Now, this question has to be asked because it was asked in the word by somebody. Somebody wanted to justify themselves, right? And, and Jesus had just got done talking about that this is the great commandment in the, in the law to love your neighbor as yourself is the second one. And all of a sudden, they wanted to justify themselves, and they said, and teacher, who is my neighbor? And you know, Jesus goes into the parable of the Good Samaritan, that there was a man who fell among thieves by the road. He was cast to the side, beaten, and left for dead. And here comes the religious leaders of the day. Here comes the people who should have been compassionate and kind and merciful, the people who, who should have gone and done something about it, and yet they snub their nose and they walk on the other side and don't do anything about it. Then here comes a Samaritan, somebody who is hated by society of that day. These were a half-breed, right? They were part of the Jews and part of the Gentiles, and therefore they were outcast and they were hated by the Jewish society of that time. And the Samaritan comes, and he picks this man up, and he bandages his wounds, pouring oil and, and wine on them, right? He cleans him up, and he sets him on his own animal, takes him to the inn, and, and, and gets him a room, and, and gets him rest. And he tells the innkeeper, he says, hey, here's what you need. Here will, this will cover his bills, and if anything else he charges, I'll take care of it when I come back. Now, we've heard enough great teaching on this parable to know that this was Jesus talking about himself, right? Because he was all God and he was all man. He was a, a breed of both, right? Coming together, he was hated by men, and yet he didn't leave us in that position. He didn't leave us there in the gutter. He didn't pass by on the other side, unable to do anything about our condition, but picked us up, bandaged us up, poured the oil of the Holy Spirit and his blood on us, right? Cleaned us up, took us to the inn, gave us a place, took care of every need and said, if they have need of anything else, when I return, I will take care of it. That's what Jesus did for you and I. But Jesus wraps up this parable, this story, and he says, to the person asking the question, who's my neighbor? He says, who do you think was that man's neighbor? And he says, well, the one who had mercy on him. And what does he say? He says, go and do likewise. Wow. That means that we, in our life experience, as God places people in our path, we realize that's our neighbor. We realize that now these are the people that we affect. These are the people that we touch. These are the people that God has brought us that we can now impact, that we can change their life, that we can do something for, that we can pick them up, that we can clean them up by the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ applied to their lives, that their needs can be taken care of by our Lord, and we can set them up for a victorious and successful life. So whatever we would want done to us, we see others in our life, and we start to take care of other people in the Inland Empire as well as around the world like we talked about last week. Now, taken to the extreme, all right? So we, let's go there for a second. If you take this thought to the extreme, this actually makes for many awkward moments and some, uh, some entertaining stories around the dinner table when you think about it. I remember one time uh, we were talking about this. I was on a missions trip, and there was about 40 of us, and we all shared this, this one of those uh, big old motor coaches, you know, the really big buses, right? And they're all up high and everything, and then they got the luggage on the bottom. And we toured around Europe, and, and as we were going around, we were preaching the gospel in the different places. And, and you know, 
like with anybody who's been with somebody for a couple months, it was a three-month trip, you know, there was some conflict that went on on the team. And so, you know, the leadership addressed us and told us, hey, we want to teach you guys how to love one another. And so, you know, if you've got a problem with somebody, go in and make it right. You know, if you've been gossiping, go back around and make sure to clean that up and this and that. And then if somebody's bugging you, all right, do an act of kindness for them. That's how you're going to love on those people is, is you've got to get outside of yourself and sacrificially love on them. So think about something you would want as a gift given to you and you give it to them. Well, don't you know? The moment they gave that command, everybody went out and did it all at the same time, right? So all of a sudden, you knew the people that bugged other people on the team because as you were walking by all the, the tents where everybody was sleeping, this person had nothing, this person had nothing, this, per this person had a stack of stuff, you know? They had all the candy, all the soda, they had like magazines and stuff. I mean, it was just, they were stacked up and I thought, my goodness, this person really was annoying. A little awkward, right? I shared one time, you know, that, hey, uh, you know, I, I like Snicker bars. And so, you know, uh, one time somebody was bugging me, so I, I bought him a Snicker bar. Don't you know I had like three of them on my desk the next day? And I'm thinking, what, what, what did I do to anybody that I get a Snicker bar, you know? Come on. Come on. Let's not make it so obvious. Let's spread it out a little bit. You know, take your time. All right? If I find any Snicker bars with your name on, on my desk, I'm coming after you. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16 and 17 in the message, We're talking about awkward moments. Proverbs 25, 16 and 17 in the message says, when you're given a box of candy, don't gulp it all down. Eat too much chocolate and you'll make yourself sick. How many of you can say amen? And when you find a friend, don't outwear your welcome. Show up at all hours and he'll soon get fed up. In other words, if you take this message and you say, wow, I'm going to love people, and all of a sudden you're like that puppy dog, right? <laughs> it can get annoying. So back it down. Ease it down, okay? Ease into this thing. Don't, don't try and gulp it all down all at once, okay? Take it slow. Take it easy. How about this? Proverbs chapter 27, verse 14 in the message. If you wake your friend in the early morning by shouting, rise and shine, it will sound to him more like a curse than a blessing. All the, all the people who like to sleep in said amen. So this doesn't mean that we act like the boy who gave his mom the baseball glove on Mother's Day. All right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, all right, hey, I got you this baseball glove. Well, I, what do I need this for, right? And they, they give it back to you. Yes, I got it. But we're to fit how we would want to be loved into the context of other people's lives. Let me say that again. We are to fit how we would want to be loved into the context of other people's lives. Think about it like this. If you saw somebody who had need of just encouragement, and these people you know were motivated by time spent, right? Their encouragement comes when somebody spends time with them. They just need someone to hang out with, someone to talk to, someone to just spend some quality time with, right? If you see that person that's motivated in that way, but you're motivated by gifts, right, and you bring them a gift and say, hey, I just wanted to encourage you. I'll see you later, pal, and you run off, didn't do them any good. But if you see that person in need and you say, you know what, in the context of their life, in their situation, they need somebody to hang with. They need some time spent, and you go ahead and you get involved in their life and you spend some time, you hang out with them, that's going to do more for them. So when you see other people's lives, you've got to fit yourself into the context of what they need. Uh, just recently, we had a, 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 one of my family members was in the hospital. And my, my aunt, love my aunt and uncle, they're great people. My aunt and uncle live up in the high desert area. And yet the hospital that they were staying at was right down here. And so my uncle called me up and said, hey, your aunt's been there all day, hasn't eaten a thing. Can you just go get her some food? And my wife and I were getting ready to get the kids down to bed, and we were getting ready to, you know, start turning things down and getting ready for the next day, that sort of a thing. And yet, we looked at each other and we said, in the context of our lives, you know, how would we want to be treated? If it was us, if this was me sitting in the hospital all day, hadn't had anything to eat, you know, 
What would I want done for me? So I went out, got some Chick-fil-A, oh, glory to God, brought it down to the hospital and encouraged my aunt with that food. See, it, it can be simple things. It can be just easy things. It doesn't have to be like, you know, that puppy dog mentality where you're just there and you're, you're overwhelming and all that kind of stuff. But it's tough to do. It is tough to do. And just like we talked about, it is sacrificial to do this because you've got to get outside of yourself. You've got to push past that discomfort. It's tough. So tonight, a couple quick things. Tough love. Okay, everybody with me tonight? All right, I'm glad that four of you are. Is everybody with me tonight? There you are, and there's some more of you guys. Okay, tough love tonight. Number one, covers the faults of others. If we're going to love people, it's tough to love, but tough love covers the faults of others. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to take a look at verse number 8. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 8. Tough love covers the faults of others. Because people have faults. I don't know if you knew that. All of us have faults. All of us have things that we're dealing with. God's not finished with any of us yet. But tough love, it's tough to love, but tough love covers the faults of others. And so when you encounter those faults, you know, maybe you give somebody a present and they don't say thank you. Mm, man, you just want to knock them out, right? Well, they're ungrateful. Tough love covers the faults of others. First Peter chapter 4, verse number 8 says, And above all things, everybody say above all things. Above all things. Oh, come on, everybody say above all things. Above all things. Above all things have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Wow. That didn't just say one sin. Didn't just say two sins or a bunch of sins or this week's sins. No, it said a multitude of sins. In other words, if you have that fervent, passionate love for other people, even though they're messed up, even though they have faults, love will cover that multitude of sins. You will be able to move past that and love people through those faults, love people through those pressures, through those trials, through their learning and growing process into a realm with God. Love covers the faults of others. Uh, Proverbs chapter 17, verse 9, I'll put it up on the overhead for you in the Amplified, says, he who covers and forgives an offense seeks love. But he who repeats or harps on a matter separates even close friends. Remember, I had a friend one time, and, and when we had first met, I, I was hanging with a group of people that didn't like this other guy, right? And, and so they were messing with him and this and that. And then we met up in church later on, and I said, hey, you know, I saw you over, and, and I was hanging out with my friends. I'm sorry about the way that they were. They were just being jerks, this and that. And, and uh, so he goes, oh, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Well, then for the rest of our friendship, he kept bringing that back up. I remember when you first met me, man, you were hanging out with these people, and you didn't like me. And, and I said, no, I liked you. It's just my friends were being stupid, you know? So j just forgive me for that. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to hurt you, man. So I, I am your friend, though, you know? Oh, okay. No, we're cool. We're cool. I just remember that. And then at the next time we meet up, man, he'd bring it up again. Finally, I had to stop. I said, hey, hey, listen, listen, listen. Do you forgive me? Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgive you. Okay, do you, do you release me of any debt or any pain? I mean, do you want to, like, slap me on the back or something with a rod or anything? No, 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 we're good, we're good, right? I said, then please, stop bringing it up if you really forgave me. Because I want to be your friend, but it's tough when you keep bringing up hurtful things in the past. See, if we really are seeking after love, the Bible says he who covers and forgives an offense seeks love, but he who repeats or harps on a matter separates even close friends. You know, husbands and wives, if you keep bringing stuff up from the past, keep unearthing things and digging up stuff that was buried, it's going to separate you in your marriage. But if you guys are going to be close, then forgive and move past it. Walk in love. Seek love in your marriage. Seek love in your friendships. Seek love with others. Okay? Tough love, number one, covers the faults of others. Number two, tough love goes beyond what is expected. Ugh. We don't like this one. See, in our society, there's an expectation. You go this far, and then after this far, that's it. You cut it off. That's enough. Why should you get used or abused by other people? See, if you go out there and you try and love somebody, they're going to use you. You try and love somebody, they're going to abuse you. I, see, I tried that and I got hurt. So don't even go there. You give them this much and that's enough. Don't you love them past that point. 
because you're going to get hurt. And we're so afraid. We're so skeptical in our society. We've got these walls up. We've got these things up. And we're guarding our hearts. And we're saying, you know what? Uh, No, no. I'll love you to this point. But if you mess up, you're cut off. Right? Oh, you do that to me? Man, it's coming back greater on you. Turn the cold shoulder on people and just shut people out. And yet God is not asking us to do that. God is asking us to lay down our lives like the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what did it take for Jesus to open himself up to our infirmities, to our sicknesses, to our weaknesses? Think about this. This is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the word of God who was with God in the beginning and who was God. Now becoming flesh, now subjected to earthly, human, frail, weak flesh. And not only that, we didn't make it easy on him. People were hating on him. People messed with him. People scorned him. People shut him out. They tried to kill him. Eventually, he allowed his life to be laid down, and he was beaten. His beard was torn out. People spat in his face, and he was crucified, nailed to a tree, and people mocked him, even on the cross. And what are we afraid of? We're afraid of getting hurt. See, my hurt is nothing compared to the hurt of Jesus. My pain is nothing compared to the pain of Jesus. And my sacrifice is nothing compared to the sacrifice of Jesus that he gave to love you and I. See, tough love goes beyond what is expected. In the message, once again, I'll put it up on the overhead for you. In Matthew chapter 5. You can read along if you want to because it's just as good in whatever translation you read it in. But in the Message Bible, it says in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse number 43, Jesus is speaking and he says, You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. You're familiar with that. Love your friends, but hate your enemies, right? Now look at what Jesus says. He says, I'm challenging that. In other words, Jesus came along and he challenged the status quo. He said, that's not good enough. That's not right. Let's get this thing straight. I'm challenging that. And then he comes along in his authority. He says, I'm telling you to love your enemies. Wait a second. Wait a second. We don't love our enemies. We hate our enemies. Our enemies are bad. We can't love enemies. And and no, 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 this is all wrong. Jesus, you just flipped it all upside down. No, I'm telling you to love your enemies. Look at what he says. Let them bring out the best in you and not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer. For then you are working out of your true selves, your God-created selves. Wow. Wow. In other words, if you've been born again and Jesus Christ now lives on the inside of you, when somebody comes along that Jesus died for and they start to mess with you and they start to push on you, the only thing that should come out of you is what's inside of you. And if Jesus is on the inside of you, then Jesus will come out of you. Look at what it goes on to say. It says, this is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless, the good and bad, the nice and nasty. Wow. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? See, that's just going to the line. That's, I'm going to love you this much right here. But, but beyond that line, you cross that line, I can't do anything for you. I can't love you. And he says, if that's all you do, do you expect a bonus? If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect anything more? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Oh, look how great I am. I greeted everybody in church today, man. Everybody said hi to me. I said hi back. I was lovable. I was nice. I smiled. I was great in the parking lot. Oh, but the moment somebody cuts you off on the freeway, all of a sudden you're telling them number one. And it's not the pointer finger. And he says, you want a medal for that? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who agree, you do expect a medal. Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. So you can walk down streets of San Bernardino, streets of L.A., wherever you are at. You can say hi to people, they'll say hi back. You can be nice to people, smile at people, they'll smile back. Anybody can do that. 
But when you love your enemy, now you're going beyond what is expected. When people are mean to you, when they give you a hard time, and you respond by praying for them. Somebody cuts you off on the freeway, and you say, Lord, keep them safe. Bless them. Get them into church. Get them into my church. Sit them next to me, Lord, so I can minister the love of Jesus to them. Now you've gone beyond the expectation. Tough love, number one, covers the faults of others. Number two, it goes beyond what is expected. Last thing for tonight, it takes care of family first. I'll explain this in a minute, but do you remember the old attitude that siblings used to have in school, right? Siblings would go to school, and they're at school, you know, all, all weekend long, Saturday, Sunday, on their way to church, on their way home from church, they're fighting, right? Cats and dogs, saying all sorts of mean things about each other, just fighting, right? Siblings just don't even like each other, mean to each other. Then they get on the school bus and some little kid, some little punk kid, all of a sudden wants to say something about your brother and you stand up and you say, hey, you be quiet, that's my brother. Now what's the attitude? I can be mean to him, but you can't. <laughs> Why? Family's first. Okay. Everybody got the picture? Galatians chapter 6, turn there with me. Galatians chapter 6, talking about the attitude of family first. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially, did you see it? Especially. Especially, oh, that means priority, that means first, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So let us do good to all, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Sometimes we come to church and, you know, we're, we're getting some victory in our lives and we're doing good, you know, God starts to bless us. And then we see our brother in church. Brother is dealing with the same issue they've been dealing with since you met them. And you say, man, you've been in church all this time. You still haven't got a hold of it. And sometimes we cast judgment and we put those people down instead of saying, hey, these people are the household of faith. Come on, brother, you're caught up in a fault. Let me help you. Let me encourage you. Let me, let me show you how I got some victory in this area. We see somebody that's coming to church, man, maybe they're poor, maybe they're needy. You know, and we say, man, don't think, don't, don't think that all the principles of God work hard and, you know, God can do these things. And we start to judge and criticize. Rather than say, hey, let me help you. Hey, you know, has anybody helped you build a resume? Has anybody helped you get some, some you know, some, some, some links to a job, some opportunities here? Let me help you out. Let me, let me give this to you. Let me show you how, how I do in my business. Let me, let me give you some principles here. Let's work together. So blessed because there were some guys in, in the young adults ministry years ago when I was... Uh, my, my wife and I were leading, and, and uh, they're, they're, some of them are still there today, as a matter of fact. And one of the guys was having trouble finding a job. And he had taken on a roommate, and his roommate actually woke up one morning and saw his friend there on the couch with no job, right? And his friend was on the couch, and he was getting ready to go to work. And he saw his friend there on the couch, and he kicked him. Bam! Get up. What, 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 what? what are you doing? He said, get up. Come on. We are going to get you a job right now. And they went out, and before this guy went to work, he took this other guy out, and they went around canvassing the area to find him a job. I was so blessed. Why? Because that's the household of faith. That's brothers in the Lord doing something for each other, seeing the needs of someone else and taking the initiative and saying, hey, I can help you in this area. So, tough love. If we're going to do what's tough, what doesn't come naturally, tough love, number one, covers the faults of others. Number two, tough love goes beyond what's expected. And number three, tough love takes care of family first. If you got something from the word tonight, come on, let's give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, don't leave because we're not done yet. The message is not even done yet, actually. Uh, I thought it would be fun tonight if I brought up some of the pastors. You know, we talked about love God, love people with the pastors of the rock. And uh, so I, I, I asked some of the pastors on staff if they would prepare a quick little thing about how do you love in certain, certain spheres of influence. You know, the Word covers a lot of things, and you can find what you need for your life in the Word. And some of you guys are going to encounter some areas in life, and, and I believe that, that you're going to be blessed by what's about to be said, so don't get up and leave. We're not done yet. God's still got some great things ahead. I wanted to ask a question 
Uh, Pastor Deborah, can you grab that microphone? Pastor Deborah. And I asked Pastor Deborah if she would prepare and just give us a quick little, you know, minute or so on how do you love new people? You know, sometimes we have a hard time loving new people because they're new, you know. They're, they're not like us. We don't know about them, that sort of thing. And Pastor Deborah just has this knack in her life to love new people. So, Pastor Deborah, would you share with us? How do you, new people. New people, well, yeah. Um, I think that it's wonderful to hear this message. And every generation has to find the love of God because it's why we're here on the planet to learn how to rule in agape love because it's who God is. So this isn't just a casual subject. This is really everything we're about. It works our love. It, I mean, it works our faith. Love works by faith. So everything, this is the foundation of the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of God rule. So I was shy and I didn't, I was uncomfortable with people and I didn't know how to talk to people. When I married Jim, I, you know, I was very shy, wasn't I, babe? People don't believe that, but I was. You know, you think I'm a big mouth, and I am now. It's like, oh, gosh, could I be shy again? You know, shut up. But so I had to learn because have you ever been with strangers and you feel suddenly uncomfortable? You don't know what to say. Has anybody ever been there? And there's that silence, you know, when you just sit there and stare at each other. Have you ever experienced that? I hated that. And so I... I just asked the Lord to help me be bold, and he began to teach me about the golden rule. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the Message Bible, what you, what you, can I just have it up there again, the Message Bible? Here's a simple rule of thumb. Grab guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, and then grab the initiative and do it for them. So if I felt uncomfortable, I figured they probably felt uncomfortable. This is real deep, isn't it? Okay, so then I noticed when I would watch the news that there were interviewers like, you know, for my generation, it was Katie Couric and Barbara Walters. And I'd watch them, and they would just ask questions. And they would get people to start sharing their life. And I thought, well, I can ask a question. So before you know it, I was starting to ask questions. And God said, now look, don't just ask questions because you hate the silence, because you're a chatty Cathy and you're uncomfortable and you're self-conscious. He said, ask the questions because you really care about that person. Because what if there's nobody to care about them and they're in your space and they need your love? And so I had to switch my self-consciousness to God consciousness. Because when my mind is on me, my mind isn't on you. Are you with me? It works for everything. When I started to teach and I was a nervous wreck, if I thought, what are you thinking about me? Then I wasn't thinking, what is God thinking about you? And God spoke to me and said, when you stop caring about what they think and you start caring about what I think about them, you're going to be a good teacher. My mother-in-law said, don't think people are looking at you. They think you're looking at them. So what is this all saying? It's saying people are lonely and people are isolated. And if you're feeling intimidated, they're feeling intimidated. And we weren't made to be alone. We were made for each other. It's not good, God said, that Adam should be alone. And he started the culture. And he started people. Adam and even the family and then the community. So if you want to love people that you don't know, then focus. Look at that person and say, Lord, you know this person. They're in my life. They may be in the newcomer's lounge. Lord, what... What can I ask him? And I just start with simple questions like, well, where are you from? Are you married? Are you single? Do you have kids? And you know what? When you really care and you listen and look at their eyes, people start to talk back to you. And if you'll listen, you begin to hear their heart. And when you begin to hear their heart, then the Holy Spirit can talk to you about how to give them an encouraging word. Because that's why we're here. Because love God, love others. But I got to care. And I can walk by people, I can be indifferent to people, or I can stop. And I can say, wow, I don't want to walk by this person. Lord, you died for this person. Who are they? And just start asking questions. And it's going to be amazing what's going to happen. That's good. I'll keep the, uh, the microphone up here. That way we can hand it off. Um, I wanted to ask Pastor Dave Simmons. He's our, uh, our 
SPT, New, New Salvations, uh, over discipleship here at The Rock. And Pastor Dave Simmons, I, I wanted to ask him, how do you love, come on up here, Pastor Dave, how do you love newly saved people? Sometimes we see people here at the altar, and Pastor Dave encounters these people every, every day almost. And so, Pastor Dave, go ahead. How do you love these newly saved people? Well, you know, I don't know that there's any a formula, you know, that we could lay down and say this is the way you always do it. Um, but I think the, what it would be like, if I had to describe it, would be like when you enter into prayer. You know, sometimes we don't think too much of what it means to kneel down, but the whole idea of kneeling down is because you're respecting and honoring God. So it's kind of like going into prayer because when you go into prayer, you come out of prayer hopefully changed. Hopefully you've encountered something. And so, therefore, when I feel like when you're meeting up with someone, and you're wanting to share something with them, there may be a lot of things you can share, but it needs to be an opportunity where you're talking with people and not at people. Because you can, you can talk at people and just say a bunch of things and it has no real meaning to them, but talking with people. And I, there's a scripture that I love so much in Philippians, and it says this, let your gentleness be known unto all, or to all men, the Lord is at hand. To me, in the, in the new King James, the, I'm sorry, the old King James, the word gentleness is the word moderation. It's not a kind of word that we use a lot. But moderation, it means the way you live out your life, the way you live life. And so when we talk about the gentleness of God, what we're really saying is to allow the goodness of God to come out of you. And then the second part of that verse, it says, the Lord is at hand. That really means that when we sincerely share with people the love of God, then you can basically get out of the way because God takes over. That's good. And that's really, I think, probably the most important thing is because for every person, there's a personality. And for every person you deal with, there's going to be, there's going to be something different you're going to deal with them about. And so I think it's more or less the fact that you're going to spend time with God yourself and then the love of God just comes out of you as appropriate, and then you can just let God go to work. Amen. That's good. Good. <laughs> pastor Joel, come on up here. Pastor Joel is our restoration pastor, and uh, we wanted to know, Pastor Joel, how do you love people with issues? Because he deals with a lot of the <clears throat> issues. I loved it. Pastor Dan walked into my office, and he says, um, you have issues? So you're going to tell people how to love people with issues. Yeah. I loved it. Um, you know, when I was praying a little bit, Pastor Dan, about this, I turned to Mark chapter 10. It's not a traditional verse that we use in loving people with issues. It's a description on the rich young ruler and the description of an individual who thinks he's all that and a bag of chips. That individual is confronted with Jesus and Jesus says this in that scripture. And it's so amazing how this just leaped out at me in verse 20. He said, he answered him and he said these things. He said, all these things I've kept but from my youth. And verse 21 says, looking at him, he says he loved him. See that word love? Yeah. Then he said one thing you lack. He put it in a nutshell this way. He said, go, let go, go, let go, and change. To love people, and the way we've learned it here at The Rock is this, and people with toler being tolerant of ind individuals with issues, which I believe tolerance is a worldly idea that's really not in Scripture. If we love people, we tolerate them and just let them do whatever they want to do. That's not what Jesus said to the rich young ruler. That's not what he says to, my, to us. If we really love Jesus, then he demands change from us, in us, through us, to others. That change has to happen or else true love cannot exist. Then it's a worldly philosophy of just accepting, letting everybody run all over you, disappoint you, abuse you, and then then we're just a bunch of loving individuals. Now, I'm not going against what Pastor Dan or the other pastors taught this, on this uh, um, series. What I am saying is what Jesus demanded from the rich young ruler, God demands from us first. 
and that is now to, to be, have genuine love is to go, let go, and change. So the way the Lord has taught me, even with my issues, is, let, is go, let go, and change. And when we do that and let God change people, we could actually love them to life. Amen. If we put them in a box and try to change them ourselves, we can't do it. But if we give them over to the Lord and let the Lord change them, you'll be surprised when they deal with him what happens. Yeah. Amazing transformation happens, and the way we do it here, and this is what the shout's about. Every number on that shout is change for us. We're shouting about change to this community. We're shouting about change in this city. We're shouting about change at the rock because we're changing. We're a work in progress. So let's let God love us, through us, and to us for other people. Amen. Amen. That's good. That's good. Finally, uh, I asked Pastor Eleanor if she would come and share uh, just how do you love relationships, like uh, friendships, family, that sort of a thing, if she could share some wisdom. Her and Dr. Becker are our, uh, godly relationships pastors, and so I just wanted to give some wisdom there. Wow, has this been an amazing series. This is yeah. so needed and so amazing and um, so much for us to take home. Why in the world is this so difficult? You know, this is a series we've talked about and all the amazing scriptures and all of us sitting here, you can all testify and say you've been challenged, right? We all get challenged in this area and, and it's, it's for a reason. Um, here, here are some areas um, that, it, that it brings forth in, li in our lives is it brings life. When we love people, it brings life to the situation. It also prepares us for heaven. What do you think is going to go with you to heaven? It prepares our hearts, it shapes our characters, it forms us and it makes us and it makes us ready for heaven. So when you're in a uh, relationship that's difficult and that is challenging, it is not for you to be right. It is not for you to just prove yourself all the time. It really is God's instrument in your life to change you, to make you, to mold you, to form your character so that you will be ready for heaven. There's a scripture in Galatians. Let us look at it. Galatians in the, um, no, the Galatians one. If you are a follower of Christ Jesus, it makes no difference whether you are circumcised or not. All that matters is your faith that makes you love others. Let us look at Jesus as an example. Just want to say this thing. Here's a practical illustration. Let's look at the life of Jesus. Jesus was surrounded with people. He's God, right? And he loves everybody. But he had people in different realms in his life. And maybe this could help us. It helped me when I saw that. Maybe this can help you. Jesus ministered to the masses. There were thousands of people following him that he preached to. He healed people as they came to him. So he spent time in a certain way, in a certain matter, manner with masses of people. But then he also had 12 people. 12 people that he chose, that he fellowshiped with, and that he did life with, okay? So you don't have to have the same kind of love relationship with everybody. You cannot be everything. Everybody cannot be so close and so tight to you. So if this makes you feel overwhelmed that you just don't have what it takes, look at the life of Jesus. And then Jesus had three he had three, James, Peter, and John, that he took with him at very intimate times. Jesus was God. He could love thousands at a time, but in his fleshly form, he sets an example, I believe, to us. You know, yes, we love the crowds. He cried when he saw them. Yes, he had 12 people that he did life tightly with. And then he had three people that he was very intimate with. So don't be overwhelmed. You don't have to be everything and tight and close to every single person. But in, like in the life of Jesus, it is important for us to, to have those people. You know, it's a, such a balanced picture to see the crowd to see the community and to see the core that Jesus did life with. And when you feel overwhelmed, you know, God is there. God is there to help you. People are in your life sometimes for a reason, sometimes for a season, sometimes forever, and sometimes for never. 
<laughs> we see a lot of uh, toxic relationships, you know, as we deal with people and with families and such. And, you know, there are times and seasons for relationships. There are reasons for some. Some relationships just don't last. Doesn't matter. It doesn't mean it's bad. And some relationships are forever. Those are the ones that will really try and test you. And then some toxic relationships. Listen, guys, it is okay. It is okay that sometimes you have to break the ties. Some relationships that are toxic, that do not lead you to life, you have to love up to a moment and up to a time. And then in Christ, with the Holy Spirit inside of you, with godly counsel, there are times that you just have to cut those toxic relationships, and that is not a bad thing. And just may God help us in his word to just continue in godly relationships. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for helping me preach this sermon tonight. Hey, what do you say we just stand and give the Lord a great big praise for what he's done in our hearts and in our lives? Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Hey, I want to talk to you guys. Just take another moment of your time. We'll let you go in a couple minutes here. But I want you guys to remain seated. Everybody pay attention for a second. Let's talk about your life. Because your eternal destiny is at stake. It would be a tragedy for us to come into the house of God and sing God's praises, have such a good time worshiping the Lord together and singing the songs that we did. It would be a tragedy for us to hear the word of God and laugh and have a good time and get something from God. I really believe that you guys got something from God today. It would be a tragedy if we did all that and then we stopped right here and let you go and your heart wasn't right with God and you died. Why? Because you wouldn't go to heaven. You would end up in hell. And tonight I love you enough to tell you the truth. If your heart's not right with God and you die, you're not going to make it to heaven. So come on, let's talk. Focus in for a moment. The Bible says that we should examine ourselves from time to time, find ourselves where we're at, test ourselves out, and see whether or not we're in the faith. So I'm going to give you a little test. I want you to answer a question in your heart. No one will know the answer, but you in God. Here's the question. What makes you think that you're going to heaven? I don't think anybody in this room wants to go to hell because hell is a very real place. It's a place of torment. Nobody wants to go there. I don't think anybody thinks that there's a party going on there. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, though, you know, I, I, I don't really believe in hell. Maybe, maybe non-existence, but hell, you know, that's just fairy tales. Well, listen, it's not fairy tales. The Bible speaks about hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus spoke about hell. So hell is a very real place. And just by denying hell's existence doesn't make it any less real. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. I could go stand on the slow lane of the freeway, meet one face to face. So just by denying the existence of hell doesn't make you on your way to heaven or doesn't make it any less real. Come on, let's talk. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Is it because you were a good person? Done a lot of good things in your life? Maybe you were bad at one time, but you changed and now you're good. Help people out. Give money to charities. Nice to your neighbors. Is that what makes you think you're going to get to heaven? Because if so, do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're good, you get to go to heaven? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough because the standard is perfection and the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Is it because you were raised in church? Parents took you to Sunday school or Sabbath school, maybe catechism class, hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child? Maybe it's because you were born in America or you're not some other religion that you think that you're going to get to go to heaven. But can I say this to you? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were raised in church, parents tell you you're a Christian growing up, that that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, be born in America, that that's what gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. You're not going to make it. Let's love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Some of you might be thinking, well, wait a second. Not only have I attended church as a child, I'm in church tonight. I mean, here I am sitting in church right in front of you. That's great. I'm glad you're here. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like sitting in your garage calling yourself a car, that makes you a car. It doesn't work. You can't just sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. 
What makes you think you're going to get to go to heaven? Some of you might say, but you know, not only have I attended church, but I've been involved in church. My last church, I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, glad you did those things. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible where church involvement gets you into heaven? You get to go to heaven because you sing in the choir, help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible do I see God is waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church when you enter. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Some of you might be saying, okay, I, I got all that, Pastor, but you know, I know God. Somebody told me that if I knew God, I was a Christian. I could quote scriptures. I could tell you stories from the Old and New Testament. And I, I know about Jesus. I, I celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life. That's great. Once again, I'm glad you can do those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible where you have head knowledge about who Jesus is? You know who he is? Now, because you know God. Listen, everybody in America knows God. Everybody in America knows about the baby in the manger. Knows about Easter and the resurrection. They're not all Christians going to heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having some mental ascent towards God. Having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God. Headed for heaven and denying hell. But rather this is about your heart. It's always been about your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. God has been after your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term, being born again. They raked it through the coals. It doesn't matter what society says. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking to the church, just like he's speaking to this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what did he just say? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, lukewarm means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, and occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Because... Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Jesus said, I want you hot or cold, but if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? In a moment, I'm going to count to three, just like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together, just like this. Bang! When I pop my hands together, just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet Jesus said these words. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven, but if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God has loved you so much, he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, don't leave this place unsure. Make sure before you leave. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm, and you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching my television in the foyer of the Love Rock Cafe, you can raise your hand and then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five over there. Anybody else real quick? Five, six, seven. Thank you. Eight. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? If I already saw your hand, you can put it down. Thank you. I got gotcha. you. All right. Where? Thank you. Right here. I got gotcha. you. Nine. Where are you at? Number 10. You need to give God all your heart. Thank you. Number 10. God bless you. They're pointing over here somewhere. Thank you. Number 11. God bless you. Number 12. You sitting there wondering if you should? Back in the family room? Is that one back there? All right. Praise God, number 12 in the family room. Anybody else? Real quick. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. We've got 12 wise people. Anybody else? Real quick. 
Real quick, pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else? You know you need to give God all your heart. Know you need to give God all of your life. Anybody else? I think I got you already. Thanks, bud. All right, let's give the Lord a hand for 12 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Now, all 12 of you, or if you're number 13, 14, or 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand and sing a song and give a clap and a shout. As we do, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. From the family rooms, you can get your kids if you raised your hand or if they raised their hand. And I want you, in a moment as we stand, to come to the front right here because we're going to change destinies tonight. So if that's you, you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Come on, let's stand and welcome them. You come. Just make your way to the front. All right, let's give a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Hallelujah. They're still coming. You can give them a hand. Anybody else, if you need to come, just make your way to the front right now. Hallelujah, they're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Hallelujah, come on, let's give God a great big praise. Welcome them as they come, they're still coming. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You just come right now. All right. They're still coming right over here. Praise God. Praise God. Hey, everybody up front. Thank God you guys came. We're so excited for you. You can put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? I want to introduce you once again to my friend, Pastor Dave. You remember Pastor Dave? All right? Pastor Dave is going to do three things. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff. And then he's going to give you a friend. Yeah, I, I said that right. He's going to give you a friend. It's free. It's easy. And basically, it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you go, okay? It'll be real quick. It'll be good for you. Okay, now listen. You said, I didn't say it. You said you're going to give God all your heart, and you said you're going to give God all of your life. Now let us help you to do that, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 